Joining us live with more on the science and psychology behind commercial plane crashes, the author of Crash Detectives, it's Christine Negroni. Christine, thank you very much, A, for being here, and B, writing this, because people have such a fear of flying, but maybe we shouldn't. It, it's, it's safer than I think people in their heads realize. You know, Cody, you obviously read my book because you write a book called mm. The Crash Detectives and you don't expect people to have that takeaway. So I'm so glad you read it and, and that you did. I did leave you with that message. Yeah, it, it, it is amazing because, I mean, we fly a lot, you know, it, and it does get a lot of news and, of course, a lot of attention, as it, as it should when something falls out of the sky. But how did you get interested in this business? Because the science behind this is, you know, it's, it's a very peculiar and a very specific thing that you got involved with. Yeah, but it gets fascinating once you start getting into it. I actually started, I was a correspondent at CNN, and I covered an airplane crash in 1996, and I wrote my first book about that air disaster. And as you just said, I found it so fascinating, the various layers and the way that, you know, the, the, the complexities, the human and the machine and the computer and the psychology and the science, it's all, it just all became very fascinating to me, and so I never really left it after that. So is it, is it like piecing a puzzle together uh, when, you know, we see the crash scene and everything? How does this work when you're investigating one of these things? Well, the tin kickers will say it's like it, it's like assembling one of those puzzles that are the 3D puzzles. You know, it's not just the puzzle, but you got to make the the castle as well. So it's a 3D puzzle. But then, in addition to to the physical putting the pieces together, there's the psychological component because it's not just an airplane crash. It's a man-machine interface problem as well. Why did the pilot? Why did the mechanic? Whoever it is who you know who was involved in the in the operation? Why did that person do the things they did? What about their organization caused them to do the things that they did. So it's about the human, it's about the organization, it's about the system, it's about the machine. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. Okay, let's, uh, we're showing video uh, of the, you know, the search for MH370. Uh, what are your thoughts and theories on this? Well, I have, um, I have a scenario that I put in my book about what happened on the flight deck, and that is very simply um, that there, there had been a, a rapid decompression in the airplane and that the first officer, who I believe was alone in the cockpit, mishandled that depressurization and accidentally, intending to, to, ra to put a, 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 an emergency on the transponder, inadvertently turned it off, which is what kept air traffic control from being able to identify the aircraft after 1.07 in the evening, uh, 1.39 uh, in the evening. In any event, I think after that, he put his oxygen mask on and he was not getting full 100% oxygen under pressure, which at 35,000 feet he would need to keep his mental edge. Now, I think he had some cognitive function because obviously he manipulated the airplane. He turned it back towards Kuala Lumpur. But then there was an, uh, this erratic flight. And after this erratic flight of about 35, 40 minutes, the plane just headed straight south into the South Indian Ocean, and there was no more manipulation of the aircraft after that. That was the point where I believe he lost consciousness, and the plane became a ghost zombie flight. See, Christine, that makes sense to me. That, that makes sense to me, and that seems like a, a solution that, that, you know, actually in real world terms. But people have had all sorts of weird conspiracy theories about this. Does the, the conspiracy theories, in, does that manipulate the investigation at all when all these people have these crazy thoughts about what happened or these kind of out there notions yes and no I mean I think it's I think it obviously manipulates the investigation because investigators are left to kind of bat away the crazy theories on the other hand you know I don't think it's a bad idea especially these days because the internet allows all sorts of people to connect including people who have expertise in very obscure areas so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that uh, that we are leveraging the world's brain power and that will you know that will cause conspiracy theories to arise but there you know we do have to at some point take, and I, in my book I refer to Oxum's razor, which is the simplest uh, explanation right. is probably the likely explanation. And I think we do have to say, you know what, this, re this requires too much foreknowledge and, and too much, th you know, if this, then this, then this, then this. And to some extent you have to say, well, that's just wacky. I mean, you know, sometimes it's just wacky. Thank you so much for writing. The book is fantastic. It really is a good read. Appreciate it. It's called The Crash Detectives. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, and thanks to Sacramento for calling me one of the 12 must-read nonfiction titles. Yeah, nice, nice. It is, it is a good read. It is a good read. Thanks a lot. All right, Corey, let's get.